feel free, fire a question in the chat, ask, tell us what you want to know, any questions you have. If you want to put ideas in the chat, you can do that. All of this is being recorded. We'll take it all back and we'll end up in the information that then ends up in the kind of the dot exercise that follows on. So feel free to fire away. And Lee, if people also would like to speak, they can raise their hand if they'd like to just have a conversation and don't feel like they want to type, type it into the chat, we um, can access it that way too. And they can unmute themselves at this point, right? Yes, they can. We do ask that they raise their hand um, just so that we can keep you know, um, a little bit of an order, um, but they would be able to um, unmute or I will send them a notice that will ask them to unmute when it's their turn as well. Okay. Uh, what is the current pipeline for downtown vitality plans? So Mariah, uh, you mean like what initiatives are we going to take going forward? Like what's next up on our radar kind of stuff? Ah, okay. So one of the big ones will, oh, that's where I was starting. Okay, so I'll start with the parklets. The, the general idea on the parklets is with this first year, is a test program to let everyone try them, see how they work, do all those things. I think the city spent just north of a million dollars on putting the parklets out there, making them available. Um, there's a few more to be put out there as some of the new businesses open, but that's we're about where we're, we're gonna land. Um, there is a uh, staff report that's being developed that will go to council probably April, May timeframe to give them the community and the council and everybody to weigh the chance to weigh in on the parklets and what they think and how they work and see if we need more guidelines, whatever we need to do. Um, with the general idea being, at least on the response we've had so far, that they would become more of a permanent part of our downtown. Uh, but that has to go through the public process, has to be heard by council, and then it will move forward. Um, on the street closings on weekends, um, at least when we tried it earlier on Higuera, um, it didn't work so well. It would kind of created a conflict between restaurants and retail and it, it didn't go kind of as anticipated. The section of Monterey that ended up staying closed, at least the one, one direction, worked out very well. Um, I think there'll probably be some effort to try um, some street closures, maybe once a month, that kind of thing, as we move through different seasons, that kind of stuff. So it's still on the radar, but the, the, the initial attempts early in the pandemic didn't quite work as we intended. And that's why we ended up going to more of the parklet strategy. Um, one of the things we really wanna get going again is farmer's market. Um, prior to the recent surge and the stay at home order, we we're actually getting ready to do um, essentials only farmers market, you know, relatively quickly. But our goal is as we move out of the state home order into purple and into red and orange that we get farmers market back because that's such a key component to our downtown and, and the, the lived environment that we have. Um, yeah, once a month in summer does sound fun on closing streets. I agree. Other questions? Oh, other things that we're working on. Um, there is, um, we are trying to do in the short term, some things around vacancy. Um, I don't know if everyone noticed, but during the holidays, various nonprofits and things, the Downtown Slow did a great job connecting nonprofits and property owners with the ability to use those spaces to highlight the, the nonprofit and activate the space. We're working to get more of that as we move through January, February, March, April, more of those activities, maybe streamline the ability to do um, some pop-ups. We have our TI program that you can basically get a TI within a week for a small TI. We also have allocated funding to help offset the costs of those TIs. So we're working on that program, getting that ready to roll out here the next month and a half or so. 
to help people retenant, to help people get back on their feet, all of those kind of things. Um, and we definitely want to bring back a lot of the activities we had downtown. I think that's, I won't call it an upside of the pandemic, but one of the things that we really noticed is some of the things we took for granted. A lot of the activities we had downtown that, that we weren't able to do this year, um, we were able to replace some of them like with the, the lighting up um, downtown for the holidays instead of the parade, that kind of stuff. Hopefully we'll keep the stuff we've been doing, the new stuff and combine it with the old things and, and really revitalize downtown quickly. Um, yep, yeah. postcards to every home. So um, what we're on the vacancy front, um, so there's a, a kind of a, a task force of what we're calling a vibrancy and vacancy task force to help come up with ideas how to retain it. Um, it's, it's really interesting. There's actually a lot of interest in downtown space. Um, it's hard to exactly tell how much interest there is because one business could be talking to multiple property owners. But there's, there's definitely a sense as we progress uh, to a less uh, restrictive environment and people can see a runway where they'll be open for a long period of time or kind of more back to normal, let's say, that there will be some activity retenanting um, spaces that are currently vacant. Some of the bigger spaces are going to, to be the bigger challenge. Um, one of the things that's come up is, you know, how do you, what do we need to change in the way we do zoning to make it easier to tenant buildings downtown. Um, you know, some people who want to allow offices on the first floor, there's some economic development thought that re don't recommend office on the ground floor because you need to keep people moving, you need to have active uh, front spaces, frontage spaces to keep people engaged. So one of the ideas is to create smaller retail or restaurant type areas in the front of a bigger building and then have the back portion be office space, a building like Beverly's would work great for that. So we're really trying to have a lot of discussion. We actually have a, we're gonna do some work with like a futurist type planning group to get some ideas to bring to council and bring to the community about new ways to activate downtown as a result of the pandemic. Um, let's see. Uh, the, are they all big companies or is there any incentive for small? All, basically, all of our incentives that we have now, um, a lot of things we're doing like buy local bonus and the grants and everything are to targeted at local businesses. That's really who we're trying to help. Um, as we get into the TI improvements, the other things we'll do, that's also going to be the focus. But we also, we need a good mix. We need different types of businesses, different size businesses different types, all those things. So we have to have a good mix. Um, Donna Lewis, I see your question on the open market at Beverly's. That has been, at least from an economic development perspective, getting a market downtown would be huge. The, like the, the old Davidson's furniture store at the end of town, Beverly's, one of those places, if we had a market type situation, would be amazing for the downtown hasn't really come together yet, but maybe that this will create the opportunity for that. Um, Bettina, I see your uh, question about accelerating some of the planned mixed use developments. Um, I, I think is, you know, it's gonna depend on how we come out of this, the availability of capital, all of those type of things about how fast they'll be able to occur. Um, I think the city in over, historically has come a long way in speeding up the development review process. We've taken, we've started a lot of measurements over time. We've gotten streamlined our processes. We've been able to engage people and do things much quicker um, than probably, you know, 10 years ago. And we need to continue to work on that process, but we've learned a lot during the pandemic about how to use the tools we have, work virtually, have people work better together, be able to streamline things. So I think we'll be able to, go, the city should be able to go as fast as the projects would like to go once they're entitled. Um, okay, I think that I hit everything that we got in the chat.
Is anybody other stuff? Anybody want to raise their hand and actually hear a voice? I've only heard my own now for 15 minutes. That's most of my day is in my own head, but you know, everyone looking at me and no voices is getting a little odd. Yeah, Lee, I think this is Derek. I think it'd be helpful from, you know, I see we got a few business owners, we got downtown slow. If there's ideas on the table that you think that we ought to be uh, trying, um, we need ideas about the future of the, of the downtown. Um, this is like no time in, in any downtown. I mean, I, I talk to city managers in Santa Cruz, Santa Barbara, Monterey, um, everyone is, ex is experiencing these same challenges with homelessness and uh, the uh, state's health restrictions and, and business vacancies. And so we need your ideas. Um, we're doing everything we can, but um, we want to get uh, hear from you tonight. Hi, hey Derek. This hey, is Karen. Cannon. I'm hey, driving. Derek. Sorry, so just trying to be a part of this and get home. But um, yeah, I'm, my biggest concerns, things that we're facing on a regular basis, is because of how empty the town is, um, and there is a lot of homelessness, which is a complicated issue. I know, and I have compassion for the people that are in that position. Um, but it doesn't feel safe. Um, we had to, uh, a man got arrested a couple months ago for masturbating in my front window in the middle of the day in front of my staff. Um, my girls are afraid to go to their cars at night. They've had, we've had multiple instances. We've had multiple people come in the store. Um, I know that I hear it from my customers all the time. Uh, I know parking is a constant issue. Um, you know, and then for me, it's getting the restaurants back open outdoors safely as soon as possible is a huge priority because just having people's presence downtown, you know, obviously safely is is important as soon as possible. Yeah. So maybe I'll I'll start kind of on the homelessness front, um, and yeah, this this definitely. The homelessness was a challenge to begin with, and the situation, because of the pandemic and all the other things, has definitely gotten worse. Um, there's been, I think, a, a lot of action across the region, particularly the county and, and city of Slow, to really get some focus on what we need to do. On downtown specifically, you know, we partnered with the downtown Slow to add in some direct help. So we have people now who are kind of a a new initiative downtown working directly with the homeless population. We've increased the police presence. Um, there is a whole room on homelessness and what's being done, but I can cover some of it. Um, we also allocated resources to have a homelessness coordinator at the city. Well, almost or all of the funding for homelessness goes to the county. And so, but there can be access to different funding and different things can happen if we have more coordination from a city perspective to work with other entities. So we're gonna fund that on a two year contract basis to help those issues, to get more resources, to really work on the situation and help those people. We've had some great success, even just in our trial programs we have going, getting people connected to resources, getting them back into, let's say the, the system or process to bring them out of homelessness. But, but it does, it is a tremendous effort to do that, it takes a lot of work. It's a very complicated problem. Um, and then on top of that, when you have, I think one of the things that people don't recognize about downtown right now, um, in normal times, pre-COVID, you had, you know, let's say 100, 150 city employees working downtown. You had 200, 300 um, county employees working downtown. You had all the people working on the second floors. You had larger teams and all the re bigger retail locations. You just had a lot more critical mass downtown that we don't have today because of the situation that we're in. Um, and, and as quickly as we can get out of the stay at home order, as soon as the metrics improve, 
vaccine rates increase, all those things. Getting back to even the purple tier looks amazing, at least at this point, right? Being able to have real outdoor dining, have alcohol, have food service at the tables would really help a lot, right? We have data that, that even during kind of the, the, the purple phase of the pandemic, our downtown visitation rates were similar to what they were, if not greater than what they were pre-pandemic. Obviously, since the stay-at-home order, those, the, those numbers have gone way down. And if you look at like December, not having the parade, not having those activities really impacted the, the people coming downtown. We try to do a lot of things with light up downtown and what we're doing with buy local to get people down there. But it's just a challenging time on the demand side in a lot of different ways. Um, okay, and there was something else in there. The homelessness, what we could do about the, the restaurants. Um, and, and I think it's parking, really, parking. Oh yeah, parking. That one's a tough one, right? The, the, and I, and I, I get it. I mean, we, take, we took away parking. So, and that, I think the parklets are a great option for the restaurants. But I feel like there needs to be some sort of, especially for our locals, some sort of campaign that encourages the use of our parking structures. Because I just, I hear it every day. People don't feel like they can come downtown because they have nowhere to park. So I don't know how to switch that narrative other than there being some big push around it. But especially as you know, things are safer to open up, like I, we have to encourage people to come support our community. Yeah, and, and we, we have a, we have, you know, our shop local media campaigns and everything going and buy local bonus, all of those things going. It's kind of, it's a little bit of a tricky situation in this under a stay at home order, how much paid media and everything we can do. But we do on the parking front, the goal is to keep the parking structures free the longest to start to incentivize people to go there, communicate that around that, and really leave that downtown core parking, metered parking for the people who really need it and come in and come out. The, 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 the challenge is how do you monitor the time and keep the parking turning over? It's a really valuable resource, those parking places like right on Higuera, et cetera. And if they're not paid or at least timed, they don't turn over. When we had free parking back early pandemic, it was it was a lot of employee, a lot of people working, you know, at the county building or wherever they were parking in those spaces. So we kind of have to keep the street ones turning more, um, and then focus people longer term on the garage, people that can walk, people who want the exercise, all of those kind of things. And there needs to be promotion around that. And we we constantly work on look at what the occupancy is of the structures and where we stand. And that will be one of the focuses as we come back, as we promote more, as we have more ability to do that about using the, the parking structures. We also have a lot of work that we're doing on uh, getting rid of the meters and having like the single uh, couple pay stations where you can pay. You also, we're also working to get business owners the ability to like increase people's meters right from their store and provide free parking, all that kind of, I won't call it, you know, it's not futurist parking technology, but it's at least current generation, better parking technology to help all of the parking, the perceived parking issues that we have. And it, and it really comes down to what, what is your perception of what parking should be? If you expect a space right in front of where you want to go, anytime you want to go there, that's probably not going to happen. If your expectation is you'll be able to go to a structure and within five minutes walk wherever you want to go, that's a much more likely expectation. Um, uh, Palm to Pomo structure, it, a little bit of parking. It's, it's on hold currently. Um, it's still going through, the actual development is on hold, but it's still going through the processes it needs to go to, to be ready to be built when we're ready to do that. Um, you know, there's still some discussion about what does the world look like post pandemic? Do we go right back to where we were? What does that look like? So, you know, we got to kind of see, evaluate what happens as we come back, but everything is in place or in pro is in process to be in place to be able to move ahead on the Palm de Pomo structure. 
when we're ready to, to make that leap once we're kind of on the other side. When we start coming down the mountain, you know, from Pandemic Mountain uh, and, and work on that. Um, I think there's, Sharice or somebody else wants to speak. Hi, thank you, Lee. Um, I know that I've spoken with uh, Derek about this also. And this is an ongoing issue that I've been having on High Gara in front of my store. And this week I finally had to close the doors and furlough my employees because um, it's just becoming too much of a battle policing the activity that's happening downtown right now. I had a, a gentleman stand in front of the door with an ankle uh, sensor on his, um, on his leg asking for money aggressively. We had the owner of um, the hemp shack come in after she was broken into and she was pretty shaken up after that happened. And she talked to two of my employees while they were there asking if they had any, any information. So they got worried and scared. And uh, one of my employees didn't wanna come back to work the next day because she's not feeling safe being downtown. So the, the safety is becoming and, and continues to be an ongoing issue that, that is a challenge in addition to navigating around COVID and the potential exposures and exposures we have had and having to close down because of employees or close contacts of people that have been sick. Um, but once we are able to open and open safely, having to navigate through the safety hazards that we're having with just the, the I, I even had a, one of the, um, Adrian, the shoeshine guy came in to my store and actually asked us to call the police because someone was laying on the sidewalk with an open container and she was too intoxicated to move and it was causing a big distraction on the street and the sidewalks. And I appreciated the additional patrolling that was happening downtown, the foot patrol, but it doesn't seem consistent during daytime and business hours. And that's when we need it the most. Um, so I don't know if there's something that can be done about that. And to, to I know the parking, there are a lot of layers with that. Um, but as a business owner, my employees, I, I can't expect them to pay for parking in the structure and they don't feel safe walking blocks to um, unmetered parking. So I've been paying for them to park in the structures and bought the, um, the permits for that. They now don't feel safe walking to the structures. So I paid for them to, I bought permits for the 10 hour meters. Um, and now I don't have any employees that are willing or able or feel safe enough to come into work after I've already paid for these. So as small business owners, we're trying to, we're taking on additional expenses to try to hold on by a thread to stay open. If there's some things that the city can at least help us with when it comes to parking and, and if we maybe get maybe two permits with our business license to park in the, in the metered parking or in the structure would be helpful. Or if we could get um, it help policing what's happening on during business hours um, on some of our main streets would be, it would at least give our employees some peace of mind. But right now my doors are locked and open by appointment only because it's, I've, I've now gone, I'm back down to one, one, one woman shop. Yeah. Hey, Jet, Lee, can I jump sure. in for one minute? So Sharice, I tried to stop by today. Your doors were indeed locked. Um, you know, right now we have nearly 10 uh, police officers out on COVID. Um, so we are really short staffed. I mean, it's hit, it's hit all departments. Um, and so our intent is when we get back full staffing to return uh, the full complement of, of staff downtown, we're at minimum staffing. Uh, we were able to make some headway over the holidays. You probably saw a lot of the foot patrol and the additional offers, officers we knew that had an impact. Um, and I think this is, you know, the forum to say, hey, do we need more poli dedicated police officers? The last um, financial plan, we added two new police officers. Um, we just need more eyes and ears downtown and we need more services for homeless. That's the bottom line. That's the only way we're going to get around this. To the parking question, you know, we've got to figure out what the future of parking is. We've nearly depleted about four million bucks this year. We've lost in the parking fund with not bringing in revenues. And so we, we're gonna have to figure out how we're gonna afford this $40 million parking structure. And at the same time, uh, keep things safe. And that's gonna be, a, you know, really, I think more police officers and more lighting. Um, I'm hoping to keep the downtown lighting that we have because lighting is our friend. Um, but, you know, if there's other ideas that you have, by all means, we're ears. I appreciate that. I just wanna stress that the, it, homeless is a, it's a big issue and I know it's a big one to tackle. It's never gonna go away. It's just gonna be managed. 
um, it's the criminal activity and the drug addicts and, and the, um, the, the safety of those that are, if they're unpredictable that, that, we're, that we're being faced with right now that are coming into the store and that are making my staff feel threatened. Yeah, so, the, 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 the state's decision on not accepting people being arrested in local jails and then paroling lots of people from state prison had a compounding effect. And so not only are we trying to deal with the traditional homeless population we had, but we also had both state and local jails not accept people. And that has just made it nearly impossible um, to deal with folks. We have people who break into businesses, we arrest them, they're out the next day, and then they break into another business. And it's just repeats over and over again. And so I hear the frustration, I feel the frustration, I feel completely helpless in trying to help people because that's supposed to be our job. Um, and, um, we're, and, and I think one of the things that we ought to be doing is, is escalating. We ought to be calling the state of California, your assembly person and your state senator and telling them that we, the state has again dumped problems onto the cities and local government that not, they cannot deal with. Yeah, I, on the on the police presence, in addition to everything Derek had to say, we've also um, on the weekly downtown slow uh, Zoom calls, we are having a police uh, a, a police officer attend once a month. Sergeant Dickel, who's in charge of the downtown for us, attends, answers questions, makes sure that that you know he knows what's going on, and also we're working to get um, some training together. And the opportunity to train staff on what to do, um, you know, it's it, it, the last time I was on. I think he let us know that like the county is only accepting five people a day. So if we if all over the county five more than five people do something, you know, on a misdemeanor or level that would normally have them end up in the county jail, they don't take them. So it's really like a compound I problem. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Lee, but I just saw uh, Donna Lewis's uh, comment that popped up about some sort of alert system for businesses downtown. That, that's our biggest challenge is when I have an employee there alone or there's just two people there, somebody wanders in, it's an unpredictable situation, they don't know what to do. And they're scrambling looking for the phone number of the police station to call. We now have MACE in strategic places throughout the store. Mm -hmm. um, but if there was some sort of alert system or direct, I, I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I don't think it's easy, but it's not some, it's not going to wait for us to figure it out. And mm -hmm. it's just a shame to wait till somebody gets hurt or more businesses need to close because it's too much of a liability to keep our doors open. If it is a, if it is a life threatening situation, it is 911. I mean, yeah. like if, it, if someone is in fear for their life or, or bodily harm, any of that kind of stuff, 911 immediately. If That's what I, I try to encourage them to do that, to just call 911 anytime someone comes in and it, and it feels unsafe. Um, but they're trying to be, they don't want to be a, a, a nuisance because it's literally, we're calling them three days. But there's days. also the non-emergency line, which is, you know, I've had my own interactions with some of the homeless population and I immediately call in the non-emergency line. I just have it programmed in my phone and say, hey, there's a situation, it's at this corner. This is what's happening. And, and the response, and they don't know I'm a city employee. They don't know me from Adam. The response is generally pretty good. So 911 and then that non-emergency line, we can look, maybe we can look at some other way because we did, you know, for a while, like the bar owners had their text chain that they had for people who got kicked out of the bar. So they could tell all the other bar owners who they just kicked out to keep from letting them in. So maybe we can, um, I think Bettina is still on here, maybe we can have that conversation to see if there's something outside of that. But in the short term, I would use 911 and the non-emergency line. That there was something else in there that um, was interesting that, that I wanted to address. Oh, um, there was a question about the uh, parking. With the new technology, you will be able to find your um, parking via the app, what's open, what garage has room, that kind of stuff. That's a little further down the road. Um, and then the, only, the other thing while I have people here, I would recommend that downtown slow call um, on Mondays. There won't be one this Monday for the holiday, but that call is a very fast way to get Cal Poly, slow PD, slow city, everybody in one place. And I think I have someone else that I need to 
let yep. ask your question. So, all right, sorry, it took yeah. so long. Jessica's ready, I will unmute. Right. Jessica, sorry it took so long. No, that's time. okay, Lee. That's okay. Um, you know, I'm I'm loving this conversation just as far as hearing the possibilities of what downtown can become in the future and bringing back farmers market and just you know um, downtown thriving in general. But I have to be honest that I feel all of this is very. It's great to talk about this, but the reality of the situation right now is we, when we are ready to do farmer's market and all of that, there might be no businesses to open up to. I mean, that is the situation. I'm in talks with business owners every day, um, downtown, throughout San Luis Obispo, throughout Slow County, and it is bad. The situation is bad. If anyone doesn't realize it, many businesses are on the brink of closing, and I have to speak for them and represent them to say that if the city of SLO doesn't encourage business owners to open up their doors and combat this, many businesses will close, businesses we love. And um, I just think that the city needs to also be thinking about the citations that they're putting on these businesses that are struggling to survive. I know I'm sitting with a thousand dollar citation um, and you know, you Lee, we had a conversation a couple of days ago about the fact that my business has been banned from any uh, promotion because I'm sitting with a thousand dollar citation. And whether people agree with what I'm doing or not, um, that is the situation. There are businesses that are fighting for survival. And why we can all sit here and think of the beauty of downtown and the future of downtown, we need to consider them. We need to consider the businesses. Oh, and I asked the city to stop with the citations, stop slapping $1,000, $2,000 on citations on businesses that are already struggling. It's wrong. And every bone in my being, I believe that that's wrong. And banning from promotion and, and these things that are actively being done, it's, it's like a, a targeted attack on businesses that are just trying to survive. So, so I have to bring that to everyone's attention. Jessica, I appreciate it. I just had a couple things. Uh, one, just so everyone's familiar with my history, uh, I was CEO of a 70 person company that went bankrupt because of COVID. And I know exactly what that feels like to be pushed to the end of the line and then not be able to make it and have to look at your employees and tell them you can't continue to pay them. And I know how painful that is. So I, I know the pain that, that businesses feel because of this situation. Um, I also know that the city is doing everything within our power, which is the grants, the buy local bonus, the parklets, the more money for homelessness services, the more money for clean and safe, more money for promotion, the light up downtown, the waving different rules on signs and using our parking lots to help those businesses. The, we do not, we took an oath, every city employee took an oath to uphold the laws. And these rules that are coming as guidance from the state and from the county are in effect laws and we need to enforce them. Other places may make a decision not to do that, but that is not the decision that has been made by the community of San Luis Obispo. And we, we go above and beyond to educate, communicate, but the, we are not fighting the business community, we are fighting the virus. And the fastest way to get all of the businesses open is to reduce the virus so Please. we can open. I get, I get it doesn't help to get a fine. I had this conversation a couple of days ago. I feel like we're, we're, uh, I haven't, we're I haven't back at day. Deja Vu. This is a conversation I have every day. And, yeah, and, and I understand, over. Lee, I understand as you're trying to do your job, I am trying to do mine, correct? And I know that you've been an advocate for the city. You were so helpful when we wanted to build the parklets. I reached out to you numerous times and I appreciate the city's outreach to the businesses in that. But right now is a very desperate time. And quite frankly, you say the law, this is no law. These are guidelines, this is not the law. And I think everyone who gets a little educated knows that. I have absolute respect that we are in a pandemic. I have always had absolute respect of keeping my customers and my employees safe. But when I, you know, the small, the virus doesn't live at small businesses. You know, you see Costco, you see Target and it's packed. The virus doesn't live and breed at small businesses. 
But like I said, I know you're not the roommate. I know that it's not you who's, who's calling the shots. But in all honesty, I'm, if we do not encourage the businesses of San Luis Obispo to operate in the purple tier and reopen their doors, they will not survive this. There will be no downtown to go to. There will be no San Luis Obispo. We will lose our charm and our beauty. And, and we have to face that reality. We have to talk about that. These these um, grants and all of these, uh, the gift certificates and the promotions, they're all great and we appreciate, but quite frankly, if we don't reopen our doors, we will not survive it. And I will say, and I brought this up, Paso, yes, they made their decision. They told their businesses, we cannot protect you from the state, but we will not enforce, we will not incite you. They are making an active choice to not cite their small businesses who are fighting for survival. And I have immense respect for that. And I call on the city of San Luis Obispo to do the same for the businesses that contribute to our community. That gives my little business, gives over 30, 30 jobs. I employ over 30 people. So I'm calling on the city of San Luis to, to, to ultimately stand by the small businesses, stand by the community. So I think I, let's just, you know, the Paso made their decision some people interpret it one way, other people interpret it another. They're not citing their businesses. Again, not, again. I a thousand dollar fine and those businesses do not. Again, that, that is their choice to uphold their obligations or not is their choice. With the city thank, of Slo thank you. Thank you for the feedback though. Appreciate hearing yeah. you and yeah, thank you. The, we, we get it, but at the I, I just, like, I know you guys are doing your job, but I have to speak for the small business community in this town. Okay, right there. I totally respect that opinion. I can tell you that that is not the direction that we will be heading to not enforce what the county and the state have directed the guidelines to be. When they change, we'll adapt to the new ones. But we will enforce, we'll continue to communicate. I hope it's not too late. I hope, not too late. I hope these businesses can hang on. I hope it's not going to be too late. I hope. I hope we'll have a downtown to make beautiful. I really do. I, I fully agree that it is not. It is this. We are doing what we can to fight the virus. We are not fighting the business. I, I really don't, don't want to go in that direction of talking about fighting the virus. So. That's, I think that's an easy way out and, you know, just you're choosing to enforce and that's fine. I respect that, but let's not target this as the virus. I, I don't know how else we talk about something that is four or 500 cases a day and over a hundred deaths, but fair enough. Let us move on. I hear you. We will definitely take that into consideration. And we hear the, the request to not enforce on a regular basis and if that if that becomes the direction, that's where we'll head. But I don't see that happening. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to me. Anybody else? Lee, earlier on in the conversation in the chat, there were there was a question specific to um, the Chalk Art Festival mm -hmm. and, um, and about that uh, event that had gone away and if there was any chance of bringing it back. Um, and I know that in my world of um, community promotion side of things, um, historically, the Promotional Coordinating Committee did have an opportunity to help fund that event um, over the course of a few years. Um, I know, unfortunately, they did lose the nonprofit profit that was supporting that event. Um, and so I do know that um, there is lots of support in the community to look at an event like that when events are able to happen again in our community. Um, and so I would encourage, um, uh, Mariah made the comment on here, um, feel free to reach out to me and I can maybe connect you with some of what those um, organizers have been in the past. Um, if there is a supporting nonprofit, I believe um, it may be an opportunity to bring that conversation back. I Thank happen you. to know that that one was uh, co-presented co by the American Institute of Architects, 
And um, they just the the as much as we enjoyed it, the labor to um, to make that event happen um, did not uh, offset the you know it was a very small fundraiser. Uh, so I think they found different ways. But yeah, it was a beautiful event. I used to love that Imanari and then um, De Calori. Um Yeah, that was great. Other questions, anything else? Any other suggestions? Lee Bettina has her hand up. So oh, I'm going to hey, hey, everybody. Um, thanks so much. Really interested to hear all of these, these perspectives. And I did drop some kind of creative, um, more fun ideas in the chat. So thanks for your feedback there. Um, I have a question. Given the fact that the way that the community priorities survey came out, um, downtown vitality actually overlaps and intersects with a number of the other priorities. And um, even when we were watching like the polls come in in real time, it looked, I could see downtown kind of shrinking down its little share of the pie. And I'm curious about the process if we go forward and downtown vitality is not identified as a major city goal, how downtown can be inserted into the other priority areas and we can continue to advocate for a successful downtown in the next two year budget cycle? I, I think a couple things, right? That um, this is just the beginning of the process and there's a lot more input, a lot more things that happen. I, I can't say for sure, but I'm pretty sure over the last eight or 10 years, downtown has been either one of the major cities or another important objective or somewhere in there. Um, I think that, that economic recovery is likely to be one of the major city goals are a portion of what we're doing. And the recovery of the downtown is going to be a big piece of that. If you look at the, the revenue generation that funds all of the services that we need to have as a city, you know, the parks, the home, all the things we want to do, downtown is one of the key geographic areas to contributing that revenue, right? And, and I, I I can't speak for how it will end up, where council will end up, where any of those things, there's a lot of process left. But I think that, you know, the, my experience has been that these goals and the, thing, the work programs that we do cross over um, and impact various different things. And, you know, they can have an impact on the climate, but also downtown or the economy. And that all ends up fitting together. Um, I think in, in this time, people have realized how important downtown is to the community that they took it for granted, right? And, and I think we'll see it raise on the, on the radar as we progress through the process um, and things get condensed down. You know, that's my hope. I, I see that, that's what has seemed to have happened over time, um, you know, in my, my three or four of these previously, these exercises. Um, and there'll be more input and there'll be more opportunities and then we'll be able to see what happens from there. I don't know, Andy, if you want to add anything to that. Um, yeah, so um, I haven't seen, Bettina has downtown slow submitted kind of, here's our recommendations for goals or any of those kinds of things. Um, not yet, we're I'm putting the okay. final touches on them. I'll be submitting those to you before the yeah. sixth budget. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I look forward to seeing those. Right. Um, and um, and I missed kind of a little part of your question, but you're wondering in terms of um, for downtown, how because it does fit in for so many other goals, homelessness, um, climate action, you know, I mean, tree planting, bike lanes downtown, right? Um, homeless downtown, uh, general quality of life, um, housing downtown. Is that kind of, you're wondering how, how is that gonna show up when the goals yeah. get articulated? 
Yeah, and I think, I mean, economic recovery is obviously, sure. as you said, right, like that's right, right. just the a number one goal. And so. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that that um, there is some intentionality in terms of th that is needed in order to articulate that. Um, so when the, the when the goals come, um, I think as as Lee was saying that the staff goes through and figures out the the work program. You know, right now we're still in that meta goal of economic recovery and resilience, and so um, I think in these next you know the remaining six months of this fiscal year is really still going to have a lot of investment. Um, and so, you know, by July one, we'll kind of be in a different place, I think. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. But I, it, yeah, it's a good, it's a really good question. I would imagine that the downtown vitality as a standalone may not, you know, come up as you say, but it would certainly be pretty central to, uh, for sure, economic recovery and incorporate um, the uh, interconnectedness with the other goals as well. Does that help? Absolutely, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. And I just yeah. wanted to raise it up. Um, and I also wanted to point. provide a little bit of context for our downtown and within other downtowns. Um, we actually, I think, are positioned, when, if our businesses can survive and get through the next six months, um, we are positioned in a little bit more favorable position than a lot of other urban downtowns because of we don't have the empty, soaring, vacant office buildings that are going to be forever transformed by work from home and the transformation and complete disruption of corporate office culture. So I just wanted to plant that seed, especially for the business owners who are on here, that we, are, we have such a walkable, charming downtown that is in itself a destination. Um, and it's not, people don't come to downtown because they have to, they come to downtown because they want to. And we wanna get back to the place where that's what's happening. Yeah, totally good agree. point, and that's that, that, and that's a good narrative to um, keep remembering and get out to the community because you want to make sure that the um, that the positivity uh, that we understand the the short term crisis. And I appreciate our um, you know our our business owners who are like, if we make it through and and we get that, it's very it's really painful to to see the suffering. So. Um, yeah, we'll keep doing everything we can. All right, are we, we're done at eight o'clock, Molly, or is it 8.15, eight o'clock? Okay, uh, so last chance, we're like 7.56. I think we're gonna get kicked out of here shortly. Okay, I'm gonna go hop out to another last right. room. Thank you, Bye. Andy. Bye, Andy. thank Appreciate you. It. You know, I, I just want to kind of close and I want to thank everybody for the input. And I know the COVID situation is extremely difficult. I understand that not everybody agrees with the position the city has taken around enforcement, um, but, but that is the position that, that we believe is the appropriate and right position. And we're going to have disagreements about that. We will do everything we can to help within the control, what is under our control to do it. The appropriate place to change the guidelines is the state level and county level. That's where the public health choices reside. That comes down from us to us, and then we go from there. Um, my name, Lee Johnson, Interim Economic Development Manager. My mobile number is 805-710-1824. Call me anytime. My email is ljohnson at slowcity.org. Email me anytime, and I will do what I can. Again, I appreciate everybody's time. And we'll we'll stay here till eight o'clock on the dot. So
Hey, Kim, I think you're the only one left on here with us three city people. Do you have a question or anything we can help you with? Okay, guess not. I guess if we don't have to be back, I think they, what the plan was, was close these rooms at eight and then everyone take a 15 minute break and then show up in the main room again at 8.15. But I think I'll hang out here in case anybody comes in um, while, you know, we're until they fire back up on the, on the main stage. Okay, yeah, and I, I'm happy. I've got nowhere else to be, so I'm happy to hang out too. Um, so yeah, probably a little bit of downtime in between the sessions. So I was just following the agenda. I guess we could have kept the conversation going till late 15, but. Oh, maybe we have another participant pop in. Hello, Melanie. Welcome to the room. Hi. Sorry, I had to unmute and start my video. Okay. It looks Great. like I'm catching you at the very tail end of your group. I've been in a few others. <laughs> you, you, you have us all. We, you have our undivided attention. You're the only one in the room. Wow, I don't even know what to say. Um, I'm just uh, really appreciate everything that's been going on downtown. I feel like our town, despite COVID, has a uh, transformed into almost a better place uh, for people at a human scale. I know there's a lot of hardship, but um, I feel like the city's really made the best of uh, made some lemonade out of lemons. So thank you for all that you've been doing. Can and I? I hope, yeah. Can I ask you a couple questions while I got you yeah. here? Yeah, sure. Do you, do you like the parklets? Oh, I love the parklets. Okay, cool. Amazing. Nice. And then did you like the holiday lights? Loved the holiday lights. So we should do that more, right? <laughs> I will put that in my um, chat comments. Nice. Um, yeah, I think it's just I've always it? felt like our town was a little bit uh, dull during the holidays compared to some places, you know, that I've that I've seen. And it's just like, wow, this year we blew it out of the park, but makes it so fun to be downtown and it's equitable. It's something that anybody can do. It doesn't matter. It's like the beach or open space. You know? I, I just think like next year with holiday lights and parklets and like the dining in the street and everything and no COVID yeah. will be amazing, right? It's just totally. really gonna be neat. Yeah, it's about time that we prioritize people over uh, storing cars. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you weren't here earlier that that, that you know like that we would be the four people the three other people that agree with you <laughs> versus, versus the earlier crowd you yeah can't oh, I can imagine yeah that might be why I got here last <laughs> you came in perfect timing it's a very happy conversation in this room now good well I will um add my chat uh comments as a record for uh being in support of all those things, so. Excellent, thank you very much. Enjoy the night, thank you for participating, we thank appreciate you. it. Thank you, thank you so much. This has been a really fun night, appreciate it. You're welcome, thank you.
Emily, we had another participant join us. Um, it looks like Adam popped in. He doesn't have his hand up, um, but just wanted to let you know someone else joined our room. Okay. Adam, we're here. If you have questions or anything, if you want to talk anything about downtown, you can also just pop your comments into the chat if you want, if you have ideas or whatever. Whatever works for you, we are here. If, uh, if you have questions, if there's something we can help with. No worries, Adam, anytime. So Melanie and Adam, if you guys are typing in the chat box, they might shut it down at 8.15. So it's 8.11 now, just, just timing. I don't know if you're typing and if you're typing a lot, just to make sure you have enough time to finish up. You can also put it in the main chat if you run out of time and it'll get logged and all the same as it would for the room. Just tell them what section it's for. And Lee, I just popped back into the main session to see if I could hear any updates over there. And Summer just said 10 more minutes that she was gonna give folks 10 more minutes. So we'll just hang out in our room for probably about 10 more minutes here and then return back to the main session. Perfect, thank you. I'm gonna just step away for a minute and get some water, I'll be right back. Okay.
Well, team, I think you guys, we did a great job. I think it was, uh, technology was worked very well. Not sure everyone got the answers they wanted to get, but uh, you know, I think, uh, I think all the voices were heard and we'll see. But thank you for doing this. And it was, I think it went well, at least in here. Like, like if all the rooms were that engaged, I think it was a good night, right? Um, for sure. So. I kind of think, I, I don't know. I kind of think it, um, oh, I'm seeing the chat come up. People are saying they didn't want to leave the rooms that they were in, you know? So I honestly think this is like, this may have been a different type of success than like the in-person forums. I mean, way less people, but I think it was way more engaging. I, I like it better. Like you could almost do like this as the normal, mm -hmm. like are one of these, because there's a lot of people who can't get don't want to go to the Ludwig Center and stuff. You could do one night of this and one night live and then do the online voting stuff separately, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So wasn't there someone who spoke who was driving on her way home from work and was able to call in? Like, yeah. that's pretty, and that's she pretty could, unique, you know? <laughs> she could type bad things about me in the chat box while she was driving too. Oh, she that's did? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll take, we'll, we'll think, end the session. We'll end yeah. the session. Thank you guys very much. I'm just going to, I'm not, I'm going to watch it on YouTube yeah. and not jump back into the big room or anything. Yeah. I'm going to watch it on YouTube too. All right. Yeah. See you guys. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Lee. Good job. Yeah. Yes. Enjoy Good job. See ya. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.